On September 26th of 2023, the board adopted significant changes to the parking requirements in section 6100 of the zoning ordinance, repealing and replacing the current section 6100 with new language. These changes will take effect on January 1st of 2024. Today's discussion will include the adopted changes to the ordinance language and provide background information on its expected operation. A key purpose of the parking project is simplification and flexibility in parking requirements. These factors are expected to affect day-to-day -day considerations of parking with both new development and existing sites. Staff is encouraged to see these new provisions as reducing the role of minimum parking requirements with development and use approvals. Overparking and requirements that lead to overparking are a common occurrence in the county. The new ordinance seeks to right-size parking, meaning the general demand of parking for a particular use or site without overbuilding it. Parking demand is variable and depending on the use creates high turnover. Therefore, we don't want to require more parking than necessary. This will be discussed as we proceed with the presentation. The updates to section 6100 expand targeted lower parking minimums around the county, particularly in the tiered framework. New tools to capture this variability are being created to assist applicants and staff in assessing minimum parking need and whether more parking is needed. These new tools include a GIS application and a parking calculator. A GIS layer is in place that allows a simple zoom and click on a parcel to quickly determine how the site fits into the new minimums, particularly the tiered framework. As you can see, the GIS layer will define the applicable tier, even in a place like Maryfield, which has four different tiers adjacent to the Dunloring Metro Station. This can then be cross-referenced in section 6100.5 and table 6100.2 and 6100.3, which contain the parking tiers and baseline parking rates to identify the appropriate parking minimum. We've developed a parking calculator that will provide more in-depth assistance to determine a minimum parking supply requirement. As will be detailed in the presentation, the tiered framework and new and revised provisions provide more nuanced parking requirements. The parking calculator was developed to capture these nuances in determining the number of spaces to be provided. On the top portion of the screen, the inputs are shown, which includes the tiered framework district use and quantity. The bottom portion of the screen is the result which includes the minimum number of both auto and bicycle parking spaces required for the use. The role of this calculator in the review and approval process is still under discussion, but it's hoped it will be a robust indicator of parking need, serving both the public and staff to do quick and accurate calculations. And I'll note that uh, the plan is at this point to put this calculator actually in the ordinance. So at various sections of the parking ordinance, such as the rates table, the, bar the bicycle parking um, rates and, and requirements, as well as other places, there'll be able to be a link that would um, that you could use the parking calculator. We also are updating our project website, or not our project website, but our off-street parking website will also be a link there as well. So with that, we'll move to section 6100.1 which contains the provisions discussing applicability of parking requirements. One of the key concerns discussed by the public in the parking project is achieving environmental benefit with the changes. Two of these benefits that are baked into the ordinance is encouragement of electric vehicle or EV parking and allowing parking lot landscaping to supersede minimum parking requirements. There are times when EV infrastructure such as charging stations or power equipment encroaches on parking spaces. The ordinance now allows that encroachment even when it will cause the parking supply to be below the minimum requirement. This is similar to the current language pertaining to accessibility improvements. There have been conflicts with parking lot landscaping and meeting a minimum parking supply. This was further complicated by needing the board's approval for a waiver of landscaping requirements. The new language in paragraph six was added to encourage meeting the parking lot landscaping requirements by providing up to 20% latitude on the prescribed parking supply minimum. And I'll note also that the landscaping requirements are also under review. That project started with the um, with the parking project, kind of started after we started, but there was a lot of discussion with the public about 
parking lot landscaping, uh, the, and and the requirements associated with that. A lot of discussions about heat island effect and all of these other things that were wrapped into the parking discussion. And so uh, staff had kicked off their project to look at landscaping. And so those landscaping requirements are also um, in the process of being updated. Um, and so it'll marry well with what we've been doing with parking. One of the key components of flexibility in the ordinance changes is more latitude with existing parking supplies. Applicants and tenants frequently have challenges in securing permits when the use is in conflict with the required minimum supply. Parking demand is fluid and the requirements are generally applicable without specific considerations of actual site use or demand. To recognize this better, we have in essence assumed that no additional parking is needed for uses that, on paper, will not generate more than a 10% increase in the requirement or 10 spaces, whichever is higher. As discussed further in tabulations, certain changes in use in shopping centers, office buildings, and industrial areas, which are considered exempted uses, will not require a tabulation or a 10-10 determination. The 1010 threshold will only be considered when the building footprint is expanded in the exempted general use categories. This will require a tabulation on a submitted site plan. A non buy rate use, such as religious assembly or child care center, is added within an existing building in the exempted general use category. This will need a tabulation and or shared parking approval. A one for one change in use for non exempt buildings that may exceed the 1010. The change in use calculation in the parking calculator will answer this question. One for two or more changes in use and for non-exempt buildings that may exceed the 1010, this will require a tabulation. This screen shows the inputs and information considered with a change in use to, de to demonstrate the factors used in such a calculation. If you were to do it by hand, <laughs> not that I want to, I note that the change in use calculator will compute this for a one to one use change. First, you would determine the site characteristics. Then how many parking spaces are there on the site today? What is the new use? How many parking spaces will be needed for the new use? You would refer to table 6100.2 or 6100.3 for that information. How many parking spaces are needed for the use to be replaced? Then you would assess whether there are any other uses on the site and their parking requirements. Clearly, if this is a one to one trade, this out analysis is not needed. Does the number of required spaces for the new use exceed the use to be replaced? How do multiple uses on the site fit in? As noted, on a multi-use site, the tabulation may be needed. What's the difference in required spaces for the new use? And does this number exceed the 110% or 10 spaces? So as I said, the calculator, if it's a one-to-one -one trade on uses, the calculator will do this calculus for you um, so that you don't have to noodle through all of this, but um, there will be situations likely, hopefully limited, more limited than today, where if you have multi-uses on a site, you might need to do a tabulation. This is a screenshot of the change in use calculator, analyzing a one-to-one -one change. It allows the input of the existing use information and the proposed use to compare parking need. The result is a need, in this case, for 27 more spaces under this scenario. I note that this represents a test as under the new ordinance, a restaurant would be allowed in an office building without the need for additional parking as long as it and other non-office uses do not exceed 50% of the office space. And one of the other things that we're working on associated with that is um, a chart or template that um, submitters can use to make that assessment of the 50%. It would not necessarily be a tabulation it would just be a, 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 way, a means to make an assessment to make sure that you're under the 50%, or if you're over it, then you'll have to, then you probably will have to do a tabulation. 
In current requirements, there's a lack of clarity defining when a tabulation is required. Tabulation is expected on the site plan. However, the question of whether a tabulation is required during the permitting process has created confusion for submitters. Even staff becomes confused about the need for tabulations when considering use changes. Now the ordinance more specifically defines when a tabulation is and is not required, highlighted in red here. Of further importance, it also identifies general uses, including shopping centers, offices, and industrial, where new uses can be permitted without a tabulation. This is an additional layer of flexibility for parking. The goal is to reduce the frequency of need for tabulations. This screen is a snapshot of the parking calculator depicting an amalgamation of parking requirements for individual uses on a single site. It demonstrates that the calculator can perform a summary like our current tabulation form. This allows consideration of this tool in a refashioned tab form submittal when a tabulation is necessary. This is something that we're considering, continuing to consider as we implement the new regulations. And this is what we'd like to do is to be able to mechanize or, or well, I'll say mechanize um, the tabulation form as much as we can. There we're looking at the possibility of using some of the same inputs like for accessible parking and things like that that we use on the current tab form. But this actual calculus of parking requirements for each individual use can be done through the calculator. And then I'm envisioning that this would be submitted as a sealed tabulation, an engineer sealed tabulation um, for staff review. We'll move next to section 6100.2, which contains discussion of standards, layout, and design of parking areas. Another element that was discussed during the project is pedestrian access through parking areas. Expansive parking lots are a barrier to walk access from adjoining streets, as well as preventing difficulties for internal building access from the lot. And again, a lot of conversation occurred about trying to preserve accessibility in, um, in our parking requirements. And we'll discuss that a little bit later, but this is one of those elements that we were trying to, we we're trying to achieve two aims essentially. One was to create better accessibility for people who need it within the parking area, but we also wanted to create this linkage between the site, the, the uses on the site and the adjoining streets. There, are, you know, I'm sure everyone has seen a shopping center that's, it looks like it's about a half mile away from the street that you're on. And particularly, that's particularly challenging for people who uh, use transit and things like that. You get off the bus and then you have to navigate somehow through a vast parking area to get to the place you want to be. So this was done to kind of address internal and external uh, pedestrian access primarily. And there are several uh, associated criteria that was introduced to the ordinance. So as part of this, it has to be five feet wide. The access way must serve at least 25% of the parking spaces. It must connect to the, the principal building and connect from the adjoining street when an adjoining street is there. It must have clearly marked crossing of travel aisles. When a pedestrian facility is constructed next to the principal structure, it can serve some of the spaces without a marked crossing. It must be provided with new site construction or expansion of parking by more than 30 spaces. New site construction refers to a completely new project with accessory parking rather than an expansion of an existing building. Whereas if the parking area for an existing site is expanded by more than 30 spaces, then a pet access facility is necessary. Parking adjustment up to 20% can be approved to accommodate a pedestrian facility. I apologize for the somewhat blurred look of the screen, but we had to do the best we could with the graphics we had available. Uh, but this does give you an idea of the intent for internal pedestrian access. The access way highlighted in the drawing is intended to connect the building entry to frontage streets and off-site pedestrian, off pedestrian facilities. As you can see on the building frontage to the side of the screen, it's on my right side, uh, and access can be placed in that area as well that serves street and parking access. The only language change that we had for parking re redesignations is that in addition to the placement of accessibility spaces, Three new, three more redesignation actions are exempt from engineer certification. And for those of you on the site side, I know I have a mixed audience today, but the site side, um, uh, 
or land development services is the area that evaluates parking redesignations. Um, this this really affects their their day to day, but um, the the redesignation plans that um, that are exempt include uh, those that create EV and bicycle parking spaces or propose solar infrastructure such as solar canopies and parking areas. And that's the other element that's part of the landscaping um, ordinance that's being uh, considered is to encourage solar canopies within parking lots. It allows a trade off. Uh, the current draft of that ordinance language allows a trade off uh, for landscaping elements. If you're installing solar canopies, you can get a trade off for that. So um, th we may be seeing more of these as we move along. So the ability to use tandem parking is going to be expanded in the updated ordinance and tandem parking is allowed for the following. Today it's allowed for a single family detached dwelling, a single family attached and a stacked townhouse. And so that's retained in the new ordinance. But the new element of the ordinance relative to tandem parking is that multifamily tandem parking is expanded countywide from the current allowance in the PTC district. And we've already had entitlement applications that have come through that um, have proffered, they've proffered themselves to allow tandem parking for multifamily, even when it wasn't in the PTC district. And so we've had over the past couple of years, we've had to deal with a couple situations associated with that. So instead of having to make that decision every time we um, get a submittal, we're now allowing it as, um, allowing it in the ordinance for that flexibility. Company vehicles can now be tandem parked. Valet parking areas can be tandem parked since they are under the control of an attendant. For D through F, a parking plan must be provided showing the number and location of spaces. This can be shown with a defined management plan or a site plan. And the director has latitude to approve other tandem proposals. These will involve the review of the parking program manager for feasibility. We've had, we had one example in Reston. Um, it was actually an assisted living facility and they were setting up a parking area, a tandem parking area for their employees that they were gonna manage. And so we were able to provide a parking reduction associated with that, but that's an outlier circumstance that would have to be given special consideration. Next, we'll move to section 6100.3, which includes guidance on calculating required parking in subsection 6100.4. The provisions of subsection 6100.3 contain stipulations that affect how the minimum parking requirements for uses in subsection 6100.4 are determined. I'll summarize the critical changes. The rounding provision is changed from rounding up to the next whole number to elementary rounding, meaning that if the calculated number of spaces is below five tenths, round down to the whole number. If at or above five tenths, round up to the whole next whole number. And you'd be surprised how focused people are on rounding, uh, particularly elected officials. So um, it was one of <laughs> one of the primary points of discussion associated with this project as to whether we'd round up, round down, or do what we're doing now, which is elementary rounding. New bedroom rates for multifamily requires clarification for studio apartments that have zero bedrooms. So we included that provision just to make sure. The Director of Land Development Services is now the lead in determining parking for unidentified uses in the ordinance. New ordinance language clarifies that no additional parking is required for accessory outdoor dining and temporary seasonal uses, such as Christmas tree sales or seasonal plant nurseries and parking lots. Just a reminder that EV parking counts as general parking, which was updated in the ZMOD uh, project. As I mentioned earlier, there was a lot of discussion about accessibility parking in the project. We've sought to preserve a higher number of spaces, even when lower minimum requirements and adjustments are applied. The determination of accessible parking is based on the number of provided spaces related to the USBC ratio chart. The new language either requires meeting the baseline parking supply minimum if the actual number of spaces is below that threshold or meeting the USBC minimum if the provided spaces are above the minimum requirement. So we have provisions in the ordinance 
that allow that the tiered framework, which I'll get into in a few minutes, which provides a percentage of the of the base rate, a lower percentage of the base rate. So in that situation, as well as a situation where we'd have a parking adjustment um, from formerly called reduction, um, in those situations, you would still have to meet the requirement as if it was the baseline parking for accessible parking. And of course, if you build more than the minimum requirement, more num more spaces than the minimum requirement, then you would have to meet the USBC requirement associated with that. So the last provision in 6100.3 is we remove the company vehicle parking requirements from the use rates, which just added to the level of complication in trying to figure out how to park a particular use. Um, so this provision was added to cover for that. And so we don't want to, with the ordinance, encourage um, company vehicle parking offsite. So they, it needs to be accommodated. It's just not a part of the requirements. We'll move next to section 6100.4, which talks about the parking rates. Structurally, the rate table remains the same. However, many rates have changed. The goal is standardization, such as more reliance on a square footage rate and simplification, such as elimination of occupancy determination and company vehicle stipulations, as we just talked about. Restaurant grandfathering provisions are also removed. A major element of this amendment is the right sizing and simplifying of many base minimum parking requirements. Most rates are now convertible to square footage or employee variables. The two parking requirements on the screen are examples of these changes. The rates in table 6100.2 and 6100.3 are now considered the baseline rates, which apply to areas outside the tiered parking framework that we'll be talking about in a few minutes. These rates are critical to nearly all uses in the tiered framework because that framework utilizes percentages of the base use rate to determine the minimum parking requirement. Changes are also made to shopping center minimums. The rates are lowered and aligned with new standalone retail rates and the 2019 changes to the regional mall minimum requirement. The uses allowed without a parking tabulation are broadened with the stipulations outlined in the rate. More flexibility on allowed uses in office buildings without the submission of a parking tabulation or construction of added parking is a component of the new requirements. Highlighted here is a 50% threshold for these uses, which will need to be determined by the submitter. And as I mentioned earlier, we're working on at least a guidance chart or something like that that would um, that submitters could use to verify that. The stacking requirements for uses were pulled out of the rates and are now identified in a separate chart in the ordinance. Drive through stacking requirements for certain uses were simplified to a base rate. Drive-through for financial uses, pharmacies, and other drive-through uses were lowered or was lowered to four parking spaces. Car wash stacking requirements were retained. I note that provisions for reducing the number of stacking spaces are no longer in the ordinance. All right, we'll move next to section 6100.5, which discusses the tiered framework for parking. A critical component of the project is the creation of the tiered framework for minimum requirements. This is the most obvious auto parking change in the ordinance. The new language expands existing areas of lower parking requirements, such as revitalization districts. As discussed, the rates in subsection 6100.4 are considered the baseline requirement, and they apply to most of the county, as you can see from the a little bit outdated map on the screen. The tiers are inclusive of planned, scaled, higher density areas of the county, ranging from suburban centers to the PTC zoned areas of Tyson's. These areas are defined in the comprehensive plan. As the plan densities get higher, the minimum rates get lower. And the GIS application that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation is where this would come into play, where you would see these areas that are highlighted in various colors on the map. When you go to that GIS application, you'll be able to pick out the sites um, and see what those parking requirements are relative to the tiered framework. Creation of the tiered framework has several effects to current parking processes. The revitalization tier now has built in lower minimum rates for uses and now includes residential uses. This eliminates the need to justify and seek staff and board approval of a reduction in county designated revitalization areas. It also expands 
the number of locations considered revitalization areas. So like community business centers and, and other places that were not in the re, um, revitalization designation area and the ordinance are now included in, um, in the revitalization tier. Like Kingstown, for example, is now part of the revitalization parking tier. Uh, the areas along Route 1 um, were expanded to include the sort of transitional areas between the 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 nodes. Um, so those areas are also now part of the revitalization tier for the purposes of parking. The transit station area minimum requirements have an expanded number of uses, and the minimum was revised from the current 20% to 30% of the base rate. The PTC ordinance language is now folded into the tiered framework. Changes to the minimum and maximum rates for multifamily and hotels were made for consistency with new rates and other tiered framework areas. And for those who are in today's meeting who work frequently in the PTC area, we can there we made some other changes to the ordinance language that are more administrative in nature. And if we need to have a separate discussion about that, if you want to, please let me know and we can talk about that separately. Also, the PTC opt-in for non-PTC zone sites is expanded to transit-oriented development or, T or the TOD tier. So conceivably, in, on the LDS side of the ledger, there's an opt-in provision in the PTC to opt into those parking rates. Um, that now can be expanded to the TOD areas that are identified on the plan. So that, that does expand the scope of possibility, assuming that a developer wants to take on maximum rates, which the discussions that we had is that no one likes maximums. <laughs> so, um, but at, at any rate, that option is available if they don't want a minimum parking requirement. <clears throat> this is a snapshot of the revitalization tier language in the ordinance showing the rates and percentages for residential and commercial uses. This particular tier has some variability in the percentages of minimum requirements for multifamily development and commercial development that are highlighted on the screen. And this particular area for multifamily um, was a hot topic of discussion in the project. And so in the, the board, the planning commission and the board made recommendations to kind of break this out a little bit differently than the other uh, tiers in the tiered framework that have a more standardized approach percentage wise. The chart on the screen shows the pre-parking reimagined rates on the left side, um, and then how the new rates will apply to a multifamily use in the tiers. And here you can see that a bedroom base rate applies in the transit station areas, or TSA, TOD areas, and the PTC zoned areas in Tyson's. And so with this, again, there was a lot of discussion about what is the appropriate multifamily rate. Staff had a recommendation that we defended all the way to the end. The board and the planning commission decided they wanted a higher minimum rate so the new base rate we recommended 1.3 with and the board adopted 1.45 so that's like the base rate and then everything from that is calculated off of that base down to revitalization when you get to the tsa tod and ptc it's a whole changed paradigm in the sense that instead of looking at parking on a unit based uh, rate. We're looking at it on the number of bedrooms. So in those areas, you would count the bedrooms you know, in your particular, like if you're submitting a development plan, you would have a projected number. If you're submitting a site plan, you would have the actual number of bedrooms um, and then be able to calculate the parking requirement associated with the total number of bedrooms within your particular multifamily development. We'll move next to sections discussing parking adjustments and vehicle loading. Parking adjustments were formerly referred to as reductions, um, and processing of these is coordinated by the parking program manager with LDS, which is currently me. Um, there are new options for adjustments available, including affordable housing, publicly available parking, and public benefit. And for those on the entitlement side of this conversation, um, those are probably things that will start to come up as we move. I don't know how quickly industry will begin to look at these um, adjustments and, and try to fit them into how they want to plan and design their site. Um, but it's conceivable that that's where we'll see these first is in the entitlement process. 
and from that perspective, particularly with um, the public benefit adjustment for those who may have already looked at the new ordinance requirements or beginning to look at that, there are a number of criteria associated with determining what a public benefit is to be able to qualify for an adjustment. So I think that's going to require um, a higher level of coordination with myself and with other um, members of various agencies to be able to make those assessments and, and determine if a parking adjustment is appropriate. Um, but I think one of the things that I'm most interested in is the provisions for affordable housing and um, being able to get adjustments if you have an all affordable development or an all affordable building within a development. Um, that was something that I was, you know, wanted to create that linkage. There's a clear linkage between affordability and less parking demand and wanted to be able to address that as part of the new ordinance. And if there are any questions about the need for a parking adjustment, please contact the parking program manager <laughs> um, to get further information about processing, about feasibility, and all those other sorts of elements associated with that process. The modifications to loading are intended to simplify the application of the requirements and create a more standardized approach. A minimum threshold of 10,000 gross square feet is now established as a starting point for the need for a loading facility. Below 10,000 gross square feet, a new requirement and adequate receiving facility is needed. This is a screenshot showing the new loading requirements for specific uses. Note that loading also has a tiered framework component to it that caps the required number of loading spaces. If a property owner wants to build more loading than required, they can, but we wanted to make sure that they weren't overbuilding loading similar to overbuilding parking. An adequate receiving facility is a wholly new element of the ordinance. It was created in response to citizen concerns about short-term loading vehicles blocking parking spaces, particularly accessible spaces. There have also been long-standing commitments to these types of loading spaces associated with rezoning applications, stemming from conversations about where the pizza delivery person is going to park. An adequate receiving facility is intended for short-term loading, such as parcel deliveries, ride hailing services, food deliveries, and maintenance vehicles. The design of these facilities is not specified in the ordinance, which allows some latitude for both the designer and the staff reviewer. Design examples include eyebrows on the building frontage, a pull-off that can accommodate one or more vehicles, a striped designated area, or parking spaces clearly designating temporary parking. So there are some steps that are uh, discussed here regarding how this is implemented, um, evaluated, that sort of thing. Provision one discusses the design flexibility for an adequate receiving facility. The second provision discusses what types of facilities can be considered for adequate receiving. And the third and fourth provisions define where these facilities need to be located. So here on the screen are some examples of areas that can be considered adequate receiving facilities. And as, as you can see, it could be an area of asphalt that's striped out for temporary loading. Um, the uh, top center picture kind of shows that. That's, this is at a multifamily building. A lot of uh, the newer multifamily buildings have signage that says future tenant parking or something like that. And so those areas can be utilized as a, as a receiving facility. Um, the hatched area as well could be uh, an adequate receiving facility. And then on the bottom center, it's a designated parking area for maintenance vehicles and short-term um, activities. This is at another multifamily building. And then the um, image on the right side of the screen with the pavers, is just an example of like a pull out or something like that. The building entrance is um, kind of a little bit in the background, uh, but it provides enough space for like a FedEx van or ride hailing vehicle to kind of pull in and, and pick up a passenger or drop off a package at the front desk, that sort of thing. So as I said, this is not clearly specified with standards. In the ordinance, it's going to um, be a situation where both staff uh, 
and the submitter are going to have to collaborate on ensuring that this is that meets the intent of the adequate receiving facility section of the ordinance. We'll move next to section 6100.2, which are the new bicycle requirements. A completely new element of the ordinance are minimum bicycle requirements. Localities in Virginia nationwide have implemented these. The new regs define some design elements for short-term bike parking, as well as location criteria for short and long-term parking. Importantly, the minimum requirement is established with the baseline rates without adjustments, and this is similar to the accessible parking provision I spoke about earlier, without adjustments in the tiered framework or because of a parking adjustment. At least two bicycle spaces must be provided under the criteria of subsection 6100.2, Notwithstanding the applied rates in table 6102.1, the auto parking calculator also calculates bicycle parking requirements. So this tool can be used to validate the bike parking needs for a particular site. And I'll note here that the bicycle parking requirements is a relatively new component of most ordinances nationwide. So we got background information from a number of different jurisdictions. We worked with FCDOT. We also had worked with our county attorney's office and the legislative um, or the, um, I guess, the Virginia code on what abilities we had with regard to establishing bicycle parking. So of all the sections that have been changed in the ordinance, this particular one in my mind is something that we would need to continue to evaluate and perhaps make changes to, and perhaps even the legislature um, could make changes to allow us to have a little bit more oomph to our requirements. But we, um, we wanted to try to at least get this in the ordinance for bicycle parking because we felt like it was really important to establish um, this mode of transportation and establish criteria associated with it. So with that, I'll note that the design criteria allows some flexibility in providing short-term and long-term bicycle storage facilities. And due to state legislative limitations, we are unable to specify requirements for long-term bike storage because of the infrastructure associated with it. But the ordinance language provides an opportunity to split short and long-term parking. The long-term parking facility design guidance is in the Fairfax County DOT bike guidelines. For design elements, Fairfax County Department of Transportation can provide assistance with the details and should be consulted for design questions to ensure the minimum requirement is met. And today, um, with site plan submittals, FCDOT is consulted relative to bicycle guidance, as well as in the entitlement process, FCDOT provides um, information on minimum bicycle requirements that are expected. So the ordinance will support that um you know it's not it's not something that the applicant can challenge if we're asking for two bicycle spaces and it's appropriate to provide them um so at least the ordinance provides that baseline um staff could certainly negotiate for more and also negotiate the flexibility on short and long-term parking unlike other parking ordinance requirements it's expected that coordination with fcdot will occur more frequently for bicycle parking implementation as they have more expertise for this transportation element. If there are questions about the applicability of bicycle provisions in the ordinance, please reach out to the parking program manager for discussion and coordination. This screen shows the instances when bicycle parking is required, including for new construction, a building expansion requiring at least five spaces, or a change in expansion of use requiring at least five bike spaces. Pertaining to the change expansion of use criterion, it is expected that this will generally apply to the entire building or use rather than individual uses in a building. For example, a shopping center building will have a minimum requirement, but the individual grocery store, pharmacy, restaurant, and other shopping center uses will not have separate requirements when these uses change out. So, you know, we're trying to keep it as, as we've had some recent discussions about how to interpret this. I'm sure there'll be other elements of the ordinance we <laughs> adopted that will prompt discussion questions, but we were focused on this one and we wanted, we didn't want to complicate matters. Like when someone's coming in for a change of use to have to figure out if there's a bicycle requirement. So we're trying to look at it as a more holistic exercise. 
Is it the building that's changing, the entirety of the building, rather than these individual uses? However, there could be some situations, like if like you have a shopping center and you have a change in use that takes half of that shopping center and converts it to some other use, um, it may be appropriate to have bicycle for that if you're doing such a large um, change of use within a single building. So, or large square footage change of use within that single building. So this will be one of those instances where we'll probably have to have discussions as we go along, but we did want to try to clarify that for individual use changes in a office building, industrial building, shopping center, that the bicycle requirement should not be an issue. Also, the five space threshold probably would not be, would, would um, kind of counteract that anyway. Bike parking rates mostly use a relationship to auto parking to determine parking supply. Some rates are independent. They're also designed to complement the tiered framework. As the parking requirements for autos are lower, the bike parking requirements increase. The expectation for bike usage and encouragement of this alternative to auto travel will grow with higher densities. <laughs>